dream in the years of 40, 50. He went to Egypt with the chains of iron. He stepped out of Egypt with the chains of gold, having become the prime minister in the most powerful nation in those days. So there was behavior development. God had to build his behavior, his character, so that he can be able to shoulder the responsibility and the purpose that God had for him. And we too, the Lord gives us a call, but there's a path for us to reach and to realize our purpose, to reach our destination. That path is characterized by challenges and tragedies, difficulties, tests, temptations, but they are meant to build us. We looked at pride, we looked at the pit, we looked at uh, prosperity, we looked at uh, uh, promiscuity, we looked at uh, we looked at uh, 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 this week on during the lunch. Uh, what are you looking at? The the perseverance, the perseverance, and uh, this is when he was in prison. Uh, and we said tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope gives us a divine appointment, as we saw in the life of Joseph. I want us to look today. I think it's number six or thereabout. We look at prophecy. Today, we are looking at prophecy. Looking at prophecy. The life of Joseph. And uh, we, are, we are reading Psalm 105, verse 17 to 20. Psalm 105, verse 17 to 20. Psalm 105, Psalm 105, verse 17 to 20. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, they had his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. When God gives a prophecy, many times his prophecy is unconditional. For example, God has promised, he has promised that Jesus is coming again. That promise is unconditional. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming. Whether you comply or not, Jesus is coming again. But there are other prophecies in the Bible that are conditional. They depend on how you respond. For example, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, turn away from their wickedness, and seek my face, then. So it's if, then. I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. In the life of Joseph, God revealed a destination for Joseph. There is that which God desired to do in the life of Joseph. And we too, there is something God has destined for us. It's our purpose. He said to Jeremiah, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I ordained you to be something. And we too, I believe, since God is not a respect of persons, and he has no partiality, he has appointed us for something. We were born for a purpose. But the devil will try to distract us so that we never achieve that purpose. In Psalm 105, verse 19 says, 
until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Now, English is limited in explanation and in words. The Bible was written in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament, we have some words in Aramaic, and most of it, it's in Greek. We have two words in that verse. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. In the Hebrew, those are different words. In English, it's word, word. But in Hebrew, the words are different. The first word is a spoken word. Is a spoken word, which is prophecy. It is found in the Bible 1,439 times. 1,439 times. It's very common, that word in the Hebrew. It's a spoken word. The other, the second word, it is the written word. And it's found in the Bible 37 times. It's not as common as the first word. It is the literal word of God, the scriptures. Now, God gave Joseph a prophecy. But until that prophecy was fulfilled, Joseph was tested with the written word. Gave him a prophecy, but he went through tests of the written, the written word. When you talk of the written word, Psalm 12 verse 6, Psalm 12 verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalm 18 verse 30, Psalm 18 verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. Psalm 119 verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. It is the word, the written word, that tested, that developed the character, the behavior of Joseph. Between age 17 to the time that he begins to fulfill his purpose, he had to live according to the written word. So that one day, that word which was spoken to him will come alive. Amen. So, there is that which God has promised you that you shall become. There is a ministry, there is a promise, there is a prophecy in your life. How do you step in to your prophecy? How do you one day, like Joseph, fulfill that which was spoken in your life. Number one, you must submit your prophecy to his word. You must submit that prophecy to the word of God. In other words, you must submit the spoken word to the written to the written word. If what you had does not does not congruent does not align with the written word then you need to quit you need to adjust it the written word is higher than that which was spoken to you because there are times we may think we know or what is spoken is correct only to find it was not from God because 
it's not just the Holy Spirit who speaks to us. We also have evil spirits. We also have human spirit that speak to us. So to, to I, because the difference, the difference between the spoken word and the literal word is a human element. It's a human element. You, when God speaks, what he speaks is pure. But at times, we are not. We are impure. And in this world, nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything. So, even prophecies can, we know, we have prophecies in part. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. The Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all, looking as in a glass, beholding as in a glass, the glory of God, are being changed from glory to glory. We don't see clearly. We see as in a glass. And 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9 and then verse 12, it says we prophesy in part. We know in part. And we prophesy in part. And then verse 12 says, now I see as as in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. So, in this world, we don't fully, fully comprehend. We, we have no certainty. We know in part, we prophesy in part. Until we get to heaven, that's when we will know everything clearly. So, the way to find if your prophecy, that which has been spoken into you, is of God, you need to test it with, you need to submit it to the word of God. If it's contrary to what the Bible teaches, what the Bible shows, then you discard it. Then you reject it. For example, God may have spoken a word to you. God may have given you a prophecy, a promise, but if you don't obey your parents, you don't honor your parents, if you don't honor authorities, you may never live to fulfill your purpose. You may never live to see your dream come true. God may have spoken a prophecy, a promise in your life, but if you don't pray continuously, as it is written in the Bible, you may never live to see that prophecy, prophecy come into your life. If you don't pay your tithe, as written in the Bible, you may never live to see it come to true. That which is, if you never read the Bible, if you don't forgive, if you don't love, as it is written in the Bible, your prophecy may never come true. So when God has spoken or given you a promise in life, it doesn't mean you violate the written word. That prophecy, that promise must, have, must be submitted to the written word of God. Praise the Lord. So we begin by being obedient, not to our prophecy, but being obedient to the written word of God. That's where it starts, the path to fulfilling our purpose. So you submit your prophecy, you hide, you live according to the written word of God. Remember our key verse is Psalm 105 verse 19. Until the words which were spoken to Joseph were fulfilled, First, he was put under test of the written word of God. Is he living according to the Bible before his prophecy is fulfilled? So first, submit prophecy to the Bible, to the word of God. Number two, test every prophecy. 
when a word is spoken in your life, it's okay to put it under test. Don't just believe it. Test it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 and 21 says, do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. A prophecy is given. God has spoken in your life. The Bible says don't despise it. Don't despise it. Value. Appreciate when God reveals something to you. Take it with weight. But before you run with it, you are, you are allowed to test it. Prove it before you delve. You give yourself to it. Test it. Make sure it is from God. Make sure it's from God. First Corinthians 14, 29 says, let two or three speak, prophets speak. Let two or three prophets speak. But when they have spoken, let the others judge. It's in the context of the congregation. And Paul is saying, when people begin to prophesy in church, let two or three speak prophetically. But whatever they say, the church is asked to judge it. Because God speaks, yes, but he speaks through people. And God is pure, but human beings can be defiled. Human beings can be impure. So God who is pure, it's like having a pipe which is dirty. If you put clean water through a dirty pipe, that pipe will, pro or that pipe will provide dirty waters. So, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. The problem is, we are not good, we are not perfect. Yet, prophecies come through people. That is why we need to test. We need to test because people can, can be erroneous. People can be mistaken. So, so, so prophecies are good and they come from God. They are good and they are perfect. But we test every prophecy. Even the visions you have. The dreams you have. Don't just take them like that. It's important to test because we are not omniscient. We are, we are not infallible as we are not perfect. We are imperfect. Only God is perfect. And how do you judge whether, whether that promise or that prophecy given to you is of God? How do you judge? Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 to 3. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 to 3. It says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and that sign is fulfilled, it comes to pass. But then he says, let us go to idols. Let's go to other gods and serve them. He says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer. I want you to see he's giving signs and wonders that come to pass. He's speaking things that are exact signs and wonders that are, that are fulfilled. But he says, test it. Even when the, the prophecy seems to be happening, even if it seems to be true, don't just receive it and embrace it. Test it. If the same prophet says to you, go serve other gods, then whatever he said, it is nullified it is not of God. So we submit prophecies to the written word of God 
And then it's okay. It's okay to test. Amen? Even when a prophet comes telling you things about your life, about your childhood, about your family, and they are true. He doesn't know you. You've met him now as an adult. But he seems to be telling you true things about your 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And you know they are true. Don't now take him like God so that anything else he says, you, you don't even question, you run with it. That's what Deuteronomy 13 is saying. That false prophets and false dreamers can give signs and can give wonders that come to pass. They can tell you things that are true about your life, about your family, about your situation, and you know they, they were not there. So you are surprised, you are shocked. But he says, after they have told you those things which are even true, test them. Test the prof their prophecy. Look at their behavior. Are they clean? If they begin to, to go contrary to the word of God, or to go contrary to what you know is a Christian way and the Christian walk, then don't believe their, tes their testimonies or their saints or their wonders or their prophecies. Because you see, whatever happened to your family 15 to 20 years ago, the devil was still there. It's not just God who knows. God knows what happened to you and to your family years ago. But the devil was also there. So the devil can also use his, his people or his agents. So you don't believe them because they said things that are true. You believe when you have tested, you know, uh, tested their character, tested their lifestyle, tested with the word of God. So we submit prophecy to the Bible. We test. They speak, yes, but we open our eyes, we open our ears, we open our understanding, and we begin to look broadly. We don't just look the word they are telling us now. We look broadly, we test. Number three, hold on. Hold on. Number three, submit prophecy to God, test prophecy. Number three, hold on to prophecy. The word that was spoken to you, the prophecy that was given to you, hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold on to that word. Why today I'm preaching, why I've continued in ministry and the work God called me to do, in spite of the many challenges in life, is because I've chosen to hold on to the word that was spoken to me. Maybe I didn't read it in the Bible. Of course, I didn't read it in the Bible. But there is there's that which was deposited in my heart many, many years ago of God calling me to ministry, of service, of touching lives. And so that has kept me going. And I continue to hold on. There are times I enjoy success. The other, the other times I stumble. There are times I'm doing well. There are times things are not working for me. But because of the prophecy which was spoken into my life, whether through people, in a dream, in a still small voice to my spirit, that which was prompted, in, you know, impressed by the Holy Spirit in my heart, I continue to hold on to that word. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. Paul is speaking to his son Timothy, the pastor in Ephesus. And he's saying to Timothy, this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy. According to the prophecies which previously were made concerning you, that by them you wage a, the good warfare. Having faith and good conscience. There's something that was spoken to you, Timothy. That 
spoken word, that promise that was given to you, whether through people or through a situation or God himself depositing directly. Don't lose it. Don't despise it. Don't despise prophecies. Stir up the gift which is in you. Hold on. He says, because, and you do that with faith and with good conscience. With faith and with good conscience. Then he highlights, he mentions two people, Himaneas and Alexander, who rejected prophecy. And he says, he has delivered them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul is saying, if you are a person despising prophecy, that is blasphemy. And you can end up in the hands of Satan. Hallelujah. We are to wage, we are to fight for our purpose. We are to fight for our destination. And we do that with faith and with good conscience. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's how we get faith. Hearing the word. Good conscience comes by doing the word. Good conscience. Comes by doing. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 22, do not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the same. Be doers of the word and not hear us only deceiving yourselves. For whoever hears the word and is not a doer of the work is like a man who observes himself in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. But whoever looks at the law of liberty and continues in it, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of of the work, of the same. He shall be blessed in all that he does. So when we hear the word, then we get faith. When we do according to the word, we have a good conscience. We are not condemned. We are confident. We are courageous in our Christian work. And Paul is saying to Timothy, you need both. For you to be able to fight, for you to be able to fight the war, the good fight of faith, the prophecy, with the prophecy, you need both faith and good conscience. Himaneas and Alexander, he says they have suffered shipwreck. Now, if you don't do according to the prophecy, if you don't hold on, if you don't continue in the prophecy that was given to you, you cannot doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. You can't lose salvation. But you lose a good conscience. Praise the Lord. And good conscience is the greatest gift to a Christian. Good conscience is the greatest gift we have as believers, as Christians. You think of it. Before you got saved, you lied and felt nothing about it. You corrupted and felt nothing. You stole and felt nothing. You did all kinds of immorality, but your conscience was still okay. The Bible takes, it says it was seared by the God of this world. He blinded us. He corrupted our conscience. Today, as a child of God, the best thing God has done to us is to give us conscience conviction. So that today when you go astray, you don't, you don't celebrate or rejoice in wickedness. That is what makes us to repent, to confess, repent and come back to God. It's called godly sorrow. Good conscience. And how does it come? How does it maintain? By being doers of the word of God. By holding on 
to that prophecy which was given to us and continuing in it. When we do that, our conscience is alive. So, in fighting concerning the prophecies given to us so that we don't, we don't stay in the pit, we don't stay in Potiphar's house or in prison, that one day we see ourselves being in the palace as prime minister, we need to fight and our fight is with faith, hearing the word of God, but also with a good conscience. We become not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word of God. I finish with highlighting the tests that were given to Joseph. The, what in, in his prophecy, the word was spoken to him. God gave him prophecy. But that prophecy went through test, 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 test. Finally, he became a prime minister. When you look at the verses we read, Psalm 105, in verse 17, Joseph became friendless. Friendless. He has no friends. The Bible says he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. I mean, he was friendless. In verse 17, he was sold by his brothers as a slave. Potiphar threw him in prison. Although like we saw yesterday, he knew the wife had made up that story. Otherwise, he would have, he would have executed Joseph. Attempted, attempt, attempted, attempted rape was capital punishment. You, you, pick, you, you are killed there and there. Particularly to a government officer. You are killed. Joseph was just a slave. But he's put in prison because Potiphar didn't believe. When the Bible says Potiphar was angry, it doesn't say against two. So prob most probably he was angry with his wife for making him lose a, a, a blessed, favorable, good steward slave of his house. So Joseph becomes friendless. Verse 18, he's put under fetters. Fetters. So he's, he's, he's tested with being friendless. He's tested with being a prisoner. The Bible says they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. He did the right thing, serving Potiphar faithfully, fleeing from sexual immorality, but he ended in bad results. All this was, like we said yesterday, tribulation to build his character. So that one day, when now God lifts him up, promotes him, he'll be able to hold the position with humility. So that's another test that Joseph went through, fetters, as we see in verse 18. In verse 19, the other test is a test of being forgotten. Bible says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. I mean, looking at him, we know, we know, we know he did good in interpreting the, the butler's dream, asked him to remember him, but he never did. Think of it. You have people, but they don't remember you. They don't support you like you have supported them. They don't come through for you as you have come through for them many, many times. If you are feeling forgotten, this is an, there were two prisoners with Joseph in prison, two, two condemned with Joseph. And if you look at their story, one, one was condemned to death, the other one went to the palace. Just like Jesus had two thieves with him, one was condemned to death, the other one was lifted to paradise. And the one who went to paradise said to Jesus, Lord, remember me 
when you come to your kingdom. And the Lord said, I promise you, I won't forget you. When people forget us, we find our strength in knowing that Jesus never forgets us. Never forgets us. And the best way to remember that he never forgets you is when we share in the Holy Communion as we celebrate his blood and his broken body. When we say these words, do this in remembrance of me. When we remember what he did for us at Calvary, that we know he never forgets us. And finally, number four, freedom. In verse 20, in verse 20, the Bible says, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. Yes, Joseph was friendless. Yes, he was put under fetters. Yes, he was forgotten. But ultimately, finally, he was a free man. Joseph was freed. And he was put second in command in the most powerful nation. I pray that we will submit the prophecies of God in our lives to his written word, that we will, we will read the Bible, study the word of God, we meditate on it, we will know the word, so that we live according to the word. And that also we will test every prophecy that is, being, that is coming on our way. We will not just blindly take and run with it. It's okay to prove, is it of God? But after we have tested it, and now we know that this is the promise God has for your life. This is the purpose he has for you. Hold on to it. Whether, you know, whether things are good or they are bad, hold on to prophecy. Whether you feel friendless or you feel you are under fetters or you are forgotten, hold on. Because at, at the fullness of time, he shall make all things beautiful. He will free you and elevate you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We worship and we bless you. Lord, thank you for your word. Many times, like Joseph, you have felt isolated and forgotten and uh, mistreated, falsely accused, punished, O oh God, persecuted, imprisoned, but God, I pray for each one of us that, Lord, you shall help us to not just be hearers of the word, but also to be doers of the word. Give us a good conscience. Help us to hold on to every prophecy because your promises are yes and amen. And your word, though it tarries, it will come to pass. And I pray in Jesus' name, May you free us, free us from pride, free us from bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness. Whatever is slowing our growth, let it be broken now. In the name of Jesus, we pray for your freedom and we pray for your elevation. Bless us in our walk. We scatter all devils and all demons. And Lord, we pray. May you empower us by your word and by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. God bless you.